PCDC On Air. The podcast of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. Keeping up to date with European epidemiology. Hello, welcome and thanks for tuning in to ECDC On Air, the podcast of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. I'm your host, Lee, recording from my headquarters in Stockholm, Sweden. On today's episode, we're speaking with Ines Stephens, the editor-in-chief of the Eurosurveillance Journal. Though Eurosurveillance is funded by ECDC and we share the same building, Eurosurveillance is an independent, peer-reviewed scientific journal devoted to the epidemiology, surveillance, prevention and control of communicable diseases with a focus on topics that are of relevance to Europe. We discuss the journal's past, its current focus and the hopes for its future. Okay, so today we're joined by Ines Stephens, uh, Editor-in-Chief of Eurosurveillance. Ines, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. Today we are going to be discussing the Eurosurveillance Journal. Um, can you give us a brief overview of Eurosurveillance and its mission and how the journal came into existence? Eurosurveillance is a scientific journal, which means it's a peer-reviewed journal. And one of its specific features is that it's an open access journal a diamond open access journal. And in terms of topics and scope, we cover epidemiology, surveillance, prevention and control of communicable diseases. In that, we have a focus on Europe, even though we publish articles that come from outside Europe, if they have an impact on public health in Europe. The journal came into existence already quite some time ago in 1996. So in the mid-90s, when there was a big move in public health at this side of the Atlantic, but also on the other side in the U.S., Several networks were created, such as, for example, the EU-funded dedicated surveillance networks and the training programs. And uh, these surveillance networks, which collected data at EU level and exchanged information, were meant to have an outlet for their findings and data exchange. So Eurosurveillance was meant as a conduit for these networks to communicate and share the findings among themselves, among the members of the networks, but also with the wider public, which is concerned with public health. So this is how the journal came into existence. And actually, it's really meant to be a platform to exchange relevant information and sound scientific information and thus provide authoritative evidence for sometimes rapid or sometimes also longer public health action. So you mentioned that uh, Eurosurveillance is a diamond open access journal. Could you explain a little bit more about the significance of that and how it benefits both researchers, academics, and even the public in general? Uh, Open access, I, I would like to say from the onset, is part of a bigger endeavor as part of the open science movement. And this movement aims to remove barriers to So everyone can have access to scientific findings and also data and related imaging and others. The idea behind this general movement is that you want to have science being more inclusive and democratic, but you also at the same time want to be more transparent and reproducible. You want to allow people to reuse the data and analyze it or just do the same analysis and check whether what was reported is in fact what you would come up with as well. So in a way, the open access is a set of principles and a range of practices to allow that research outputs are distributed, first of all, online, free of access charges or other barriers. And the diamond open access for us means it's not only the access charges for those who want to read the papers, but it's also charges for the scientists who want to publish. And often these principles are coupled with removal of barriers to copying So in our case, we're publishing under a CC BY license, which means people can reuse the materials that we publish. They can change it, but they need to attribute it to the source. So that's all in all what is important, that the authors also retain their copyright, but we are given a license and we have the license that entails that people can reuse the materials. How are Eurosurveillance and ECDC linked together? So why have we brought you here? The initial project was funded by the EU and uh, there were two publishers because there were two different journals, a bulletin style and a more classical scholarly journal style that were published both in two different locations. And so when ECDC came to live in 2005, there was many of these dedicated surveillance networks were transferred into ECDC. And there was also the question, what are we doing with 
this network. And it was felt that this was a very valuable tool to communicate. And so ECDC took over as funder of the journal in 2007 and ever since is the publisher which funds the journal and gives us the resources to operate as we do. However, at the same time, because we are a scholarly journal and a peer-reviewed journal, the ECDC gives us editorial independence, which means the content of the journal is not determined by, for example, the ECDC director. They wouldn't know what is published in the journal and they wouldn't tell us what we need to publish. So this is what the editorial independence means. And content is decided on quality, is decided on relevance. And it's also decided in terms of, for example, what have we published and covered already and what do we think is evidence that is needed. And hereby we have a big network across Europe of experts and also of members in our board who help us select the adequate articles. Okay, so well, you mentioned sort of some of the types of articles in a bit of a general way. So what kind of articles are being published and how do you ensure the sort of quality and the relevance of the published content? Well, we have rapid communications, which is a bit of a specific feature, which is short, authoritative reports that are published between one and two weeks or sometimes even faster from submission. And then we have the more classic, the regular article types, such as outbreak, surveillance, research and review articles that undergo the longer term and they're longer and they're more in-depth analysis and they undergo the peer review and the editing in a bit of a more long-term view in a different pace, let's say. We also publish letters to the editors, editorials, perspectives, which give a bit more of an opinion where scientists or experts have the chance to express opinions, comment on other people's papers. Even though most importantly, your surveillance publishes data-driven articles, so we're not so much interested in seeing strong opinions, but it's more opinions in the sense of what does it mean for public health? What does a specific policy entail and how can it impact for public health? It's not about do I like this idea or not in that sense. How do we ensure quality? I already mentioned that, I think. The quality and selection, selection based on content, the quality, public health relevance, that are some of the aspects. Other aspects could be, for example, also, do we know enough of this topic already? Is this a new topic? Is something that's emerging? Is it a country from where we have very little evidence that could also be, even if the quality may need more work jointly with the office to improve it, but the data are important because there's a gap in data, gap in knowledge. It could also be that you have already some articles that were published on a topic, but you need to see what has been published from one country is also relevant in another country, so in another setting, for example. So this could be one reason to publish on the same topic several times, for example. And the quality we ensure through rigorous peer review, we have a wide network of peer reviewers, experts in their field, we invite to comment on articles. We also have our network of board members with specific subject matter expertise who we involve, for example, if we're not sure ourselves and we discuss in the team. So we have complementary expertise in the team. So all articles are discussed when they are newly submitted, whether we or not we send them for peer review. They're discussed after peer review, whether or not we have been given the guidance that helps us to decide whether an article is valid enough, sound enough, whether the methodology and the findings are backing up the, the conclusions that are drawn. So all of this is discussed in several iterative rounds before we move even to asking authors to revise for example, and then we enter in a dialogue either at the revision phase already or then at the editing stage. There's a lot of input from the editors at that stage as well. Well, you kind of uh, broached this a little bit to begin with. More concretely, how does Eurosurveillance contribute to public health in Europe? Well, as I mentioned already, the rapid communication, that's one of the strengths of the journal. We have a good network of reviewers. We can turn around articles and sometimes in a speed which is only allowed because people at the other end of the globe, so to speak, they work when we sleep and they look at articles or they know that an article may come their way and they are interested and they're experts. So they work when we sleep and then we can work hand in hand with the authors provided that the peer review is positive and we think also there are no major methodological concerns with an article. Then we can facilitate measures, we can facilitate articles that may spark measures in other countries, for example, 
if one country experiences an outbreak and we can lift this signal of an outbreak to other countries, we would then be able to look whether in their data they see similar trends, for example. And examples evidently are the monkeypox outbreak when, when it emerged in Europe among MSM, a community that we hadn't seen as being infected. First of all, the, country, the, the disease hadn't been seen and as endemic in Europe. And also a community was affected or a group of the population was affected, which we hadn't seen as such before. And then another example is, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic, when a lot of articles needed to be provided with a very unprecedented speed because there was very little evidence in how to deal with this novel virus, for example, and how to detect the novel virus. What are the lab measures that we have in place to detect the new virus? So that all accelerated the even rapid speed further. So then we also provide, of course, basis for policy making, And we have anecdotal evidence, for example, from our colleagues in Slovenia who published an article on illustrating that TBE vaccination programs that would target children have a high impact on the disease burden and higher than what could be anticipated. So apparently this led to a change in the policy, in the vaccination policy in Slovenia. And we have another example of an article, for example, that we published during the COVID-19 pandemic where uh, researchers systematically set up a laboratory methodology by which they could test CE-marked rapid antigen tests to detect whether or not someone would be infected with COVID. And they set certain uh, quality thresholds. And then they systematically tested a list of 122 uh, tests that were CE-marked and looked whether they would pass the quality threshold or not. And the list of the, the tests that passed the threshold, not only passed the threshold, was then published online in a member state at an official body of a member state. So people would go and access this list and see whether or not they would want to buy this test, for example, for their purpose. Yeah, that would be maybe two examples there. Perfect. Can help. So in the context of emerging infectious diseases, how does your surveillance balance publishing sort of timely, rapid information while also maintaining this rigorous peer review. Obviously, you, you mentioned when we're sleeping, someone else at night is reviewing. But is there any sort of chance that something could be published too quickly? There's no zero risk in life, right? <laughs> <laughs> But you can do as much as possible to avoid publishing information which is misleading. So we have quite a strong quality control mechanism, not only during the peer review, but also after peer review. And we work intensively and hand in hand with our authors on the editing. All the scientific editors have a scientific background and they are knowledgeable in their fields. And they've been working for a long time with the journal. So they have also acquired quite a sound knowledge in that field and also a feeling for where you need to probe a little bit and where inconsistencies could be found. And also we have at the end the four I principles. So all articles are not only being handled during the editing process by one editor. There's always a final quality check before green light is given for publication. And through all these reiterative steps, we fine tune the messages. We see if there are weak points. And in the many years that we've published the journal so far, we haven't evidenced major flaws in our articles, which is hopefully also encouraging the readers that we do strong quality controls. Okay, so the journal has been in operation for many years now. How has it evolved over time and what other challenges have you faced along the way? I also alluded to that it has evolved from a bulletin, so from two journals, a bulletin style news like it was called Eurosurveillance Weekly. That was the weekly bulletin. It really had 500 words type of articles, which we wouldn't publish today anymore. It was more a news feed and this more traditional journal. So we merged the two formats when ECDC had become the publisher. And it was quite a risk because it wasn't quite evident if this would work. At the time, there were very few journals that had this form of rapid communications, but it's worked out well. So, But this was definitely one challenge. Another challenge is that because of the applied public health relevance and the speed of publications, the journal has become quite popular. It's, it's ranking among the top infectious disease journals in several metrics and it's, it has a good reputation. So, of course, one challenge is with a relatively small team, we're five in the team, to uphold 
this success over time because the size of the team hasn't really changed over time. There are many other challenges, of course, because the world is evolving. Uh, we have we see new technologies coming along, and we see new technologies and new speed, as you've seen during the pandemic. Everybody wants to get the faster, so also authors are expecting articles to be turned around faster. And there's certainly a limitation to the speed that you can go without in a full length research article without running the risk of cutting on quality. And really in the pandemic, decision making was quite a challenge. Another challenge will be in the future that I see is how will we operate in an environment where disrupting technologies like AI, for example, come up? And what will that mean? How will we be able to judge if a text is generated by a human or by an AI, and I don't think we have any technological solutions as yet that can finally help us. And we have, will have to move on and we have to keep alert to new developments and keep in touch with other editors and publishers to see how we face the new environments in that sense. So two years ago, uh, there was a 25th anniversary issue. Could you talk about the articles that were in that issue and where Eurosurveillance made a difference? For this issue, we asked our board members and more widely some people who had been collaborating with us what type of articles and what kind of articles or instances they would remember uh, from their long-standing history where they thought it would make an impact. And you'll find a collection of these along the years. I think we selected one for each year. In the end, uh, you will find them in a collection on our website. But I will give you one example where we think that the journal has had an important impact on public health policies or interventions. During the influenza season, we usually publish articles or we regularly publish articles on interim vaccine effectiveness estimates during the season, in-season vaccine effectiveness estimates. And we publish those because it's important to see how well does the influenza vaccine work in the respective season. As you may know, the influenza vaccine will have to be adapted because there's a slight change in the viruses circulating every year in some properties. So the virus and the circulating viruses and the vaccine, there's a risk that they don't match exactly well. And so we need to know because you want to take measures, particularly for those people who are at risk of severe disease, you want to give them, for example, antivirals earlier, and you want to flag also the risk to physicians, for example, who treat people who are at risk. So uh, we published in 2014 and 15 an article from the Canada Sentinel Physician Surveillance Network in January 2015, where it was shown that because of a substantial vaccine mismatch, little or no vaccine protection was observed, which was, of course, not a very positive message, which is not a good message because you don't want to erode also the trust in vaccines. But it's good to be open and to say this year we have a problem so we need to take other countermeasures as possible. And this is also one way of hopefully establishing trust when in the next year the vaccine is working well, you have the same communication. You can say, actually, this year we can really rely on the vaccine. It's a good match. Uh, that's one example maybe that helps to illustrate how and how far the articles that we publish can have significant impact on public health policies, or in this case, interventions. So with the release of the articles quite rapidly and quite regularly, do you ever consider having a theme for maybe one or two issues or for a year? Is that something that the journal considers? Yes. In the past, we have made special calls for a certain topic for which we pre-selected. And we realized that handling articles which would come in at different times, it was very difficult then to have them published at the same time. So we've moved away a bit from this approach. And we've started annual themes. So we have, for example, an annual theme in the upcoming year, which is on climate change and urbanization's impact on infectious diseases, which also touches on a wide area of uh, related subject matters, like I mentioned already climate change, but also it could be relating to urban planning or um, behavioral science. So uh, with the themes, we intend to cover a wide subject also of neighboring disciplines that may have an impact on epidemiology and of infectious diseases. So what we do as well is we have so-called focused issues. We regularly run, for example, around the time of uh, World TB Day, World AIDS Day, we would regularly run 
articles on the very topic and often other world days, World Hepatitis Day, for example, or if there's World Rabies Day and we happen to have a submission that is dealing with the topic on rabies, we would then preferably publish on a day to really also highlight that this is an important day and an important topic. That's uh, one approach that we have, but not as previously the classical way of special issues. We had a training with uh, some young researchers and the young researchers said, why do you bother about issues at all? Nobody <laughs> today opens a journal like you old folks have done this. So in a way, we cater for two different communities. We, we cater for the community who still likes to receive a table of content every week on a certain day and go through it and decide, I will want to read this. And a community who goes on and uses a search engine or database like PubMed and searches for it because they're only interested in a specific topic. So that's a little bit of why we have a mix of topical approaches and uh, mixed topics in, an, in, in a weekly issue. Okay. So coming up to my final question, and, and again, you've kind of touched on this a little bit already, but what are your future goals and aspirations for the journal? Uh, how do you see it evolving to meet uh, the challenges in an ever-changing global health landscape? One important point, at least, for me and the team is keeping up with the good reputation and continue to work with public health experts and scientists to continue to provide sound and solid information that is, you can take public health action on so that you can really take the data and do something with it so you can apply it in your policies and you can be sure that this is authoritative enough and good and sound and vetted enough. So I think remaining and maintaining the quality is definitely something which should go forward also into the future. And also we need to remain vigilant to opportunities. And I mentioned already new disruptive technologies such as generative AI and others. They also, they don't only have the negative aspects, but there may be also opportunities that we need to harvest. And we should definitely also remain vigilant to where we can capitalize on new developments, which I cannot practically foresee now, but we need to be alert, I would say. Okay, great. Well, that's all the questions I have for you today. Thank you very much for spending this time with us and I uh, hope to have you back on the podcast again in the future. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you would like to know more about Eurosurveillance and the articles discussed, you can find a link in the notes of this episode. For more information about ECDC in general, please visit ecdc.europa.eu or follow us on social media for the latest news.